Um, where indeed I used to live and work until four months ago for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which is a very, for the topic of this conference, is a very interesting organization. It's a diaspora organization, basically, which raises significant funds, annually several hundred million dollars, uh, for distribution to different uh, projects, let's say in Israel, annually about 200 million dollars, um, that in partnership with the Israeli government we allocate uh, towards different uh, humanitarian projects for those that are in need. We're developing social services, for example, for um, elderly, for youth at risk, for immigrants, um, and the government also uh, contributes financially to this uh, project. So it's an interesting example of a partnership between the diaspora on the one hand and uh, the government of Israel. Before I continue, let me express gratitude both to the Danos Conference Center for organizing this very interesting uh, roundtable and for the, to the Israeli Embassy for facilitating uh, my, my personal participation in this roundtable. I will try to keep to the 50 minutes, uh, I understand I have to because otherwise the bell will ring. Uh, I prepared a few slides, I'm not sure how long it will take, but um, if necessary, we'll stop in a minute. And, and I'm happy at the end uh, to address any questions um, that I might not have uh, addressed during my presentation. Um, before I go to the Israel case study, and, and I want to warn you, this is not only good practice that, uh, that can be copy and paste it in the Serbian context. But yes, we do have some uh, experience in this domain, and some lessons can be learned, whether from successes, but also from failures in, in this domain. Um, but before I go into the Israeli case study, I would like to make a, you know, make a few general comments more from an international perspective. We, we mentioned the return of the diaspora. Um, importance to, to, to ask the question, why do diasporas return home? to their ancestral homeland, especially cases that have never been present, been in that particular country. Um, the initial drive to move to another country is often, in our experience, is, is economic. There might be political upsets and, and there might be persecution, and, but, but often the initial drive to move from one country is economic. Um, economically based. But then you cannot just explain based on economic why people move to the diaspora, uh, from the diaspora to, to the homeland. For example, um, the, the million Russian Jews that came during the 1990s to Israel, they also had other alternatives. They could have gone, in many cases, to Germany or to the North America, US and Canada, you know, more wealthy places than Israel in many respects. They chose to come to Israel. This is, can only be explained by, on the one hand, the sort of the ethnic identification with Israel. On the other hand, government policy. And uh, government policy does play an important role in, in, in those terms. Um, similarly, how can you explain someone who lives in California with very well established an ethnic Armenian and comes back to Yerevan or from Chicago to, to Belgrade? And, you know, they are very well established. And they don't come for economic reasons, they come for other reasons. So there is a mixture of, let's say, ethnic uh, motivations and, um, and economic and political reasons, I would say. I, in general, I think there's two models. This is a, this is a huge simplification on, on, in terms of diaspora home relations, but I think there's, you can differentiate between a European model and an Asian model. What do I mean? European model is where, for example, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, um, Germany, Mediterranean countries, that basically say that the state is responsible for co-nationals that may not necessarily live within the boundaries of the state. They take responsibility whether it's in education, in health, in employment, in citizenship rights, voting rights, to co-nationals that, that live outside of its boundaries. They don't, they're not necessarily concerned with the interests of the state. However, on the contrary, I think many Asian states, I'm thinking of Japan, China, their diaspora policy is very much determined by the question, how can the diaspora support the development of the state? Whether in South Korea and Japan, they basically took, um, they invited, uh, or they, they liberalized immigration policies for 
co-nationals, mainly from, from, for example, Japanese in Brazil, to, to replace labor migrants where doing no skilled work in, in some factories. So there was self-interest in helping uh, to address some employment needs in the labor market. Then, for example, China. It addresses not just its 30 million plus diaspora in general terms, it addresses specifically those most educated and those most wealthy members of the diaspora, for example, by facilitating their investment in China. When we look at the late, late 1980s, I think it was 1989, well over half of all foreign direct investment came from the diaspora. Uh, it was more than $30 billion. When you look at India, the most successful IT companies are, uh, are managed and owned by people who have been attracted back um, from, let's say, California, for some, from Silicon Valley. Um, so the contrast is, on one hand, a diaspora policy based on the needs of the diaspora and the state carries responsibility. And then on the other hand, there's this model where the diaspora can contribute to the, the, the strengthening of the state. And I think Serbia can choose from both these models in, in, uh, in um, determining its policies. But of course, it's, it's geographically part of Europe and of part of that, that tradition. Um, then I would like to, to move um, towards Israel. First of all, um, I mentioned Israel has some successes and, and failures when it comes to its diaspora policy. I, of course, am going to focus on the successes. Um, there's two aspects of, of, uh, of this, let's say, Israeli model. When we think about mobilizing diaspora resources for national development, one is attracting the human capital, promoting return to strengthening the, the, the demography, the, the labor market of the state. And the second aspect is attracting philanthropic contributions um, and, and there there's a quite a success story I would say and, and, and I think especially in that domain there are some important lessons to be learned. And so the diaspora in general uh, is still more uh, bigger in size than, than the Israeli population. Um, actual return at the moment is only less than 20,000 uh, people per year. But the links between the diaspora and Israel are extensive indeed, whether the people come back or not. So first let me talk a little bit about the, 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 the aspect of return. Um, only two, three years after the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948, um, a law was elaborated called the law of return. This is basically an ideological proclamation stating that everyone in the diaspora, every member of the diaspora being defined as having uh, Jewish ancestry uh, from second generation, so having at least one Jewish grandparent, everyone in the diaspora can return home, which means you come to the airport, you receive a passport, you receive citizenship. Um, it doesn't go into detail about what sort of other rights you have in terms of um, integration assistance and whatnot. It's an ideological proclamation of solidarity with all the diaspora around the world, whether they are persecuted or want to come back home for other reasons. And I'm sta saying this, I'm emphasizing this because, you know, of course there is a discriminatory element in, in this in, uh, immigration policy which specifically targets people with, um, let's, say, let's say, ancestral roots in your own country. So, you know, it can be argued as racist. But you look around, and many, many very liberal democracies in Europe have similar laws. You look at Germany, people, let's say, uh, German Aussiedler who come back, you know, uh, who have maybe never lived, uh, probably never been in Germany, but they have lived in the former Soviet Union, they come back, they immediately receive citizenship. Um, there's many other examples. And it's quite common that countries um, prioritize or give easier citizenship and migration um, rights and status to co-nationals living abroad. Um, so that's the framework, the ideological context for, for attracting, uh, uh, let's say, diaspora to come home. And it's, if anything, it's, you know, even in some countries, I was recently in Armenia, 
and they were they, they were very discussing the development of a repatriation law for Armenia. They were saying, well, you know, not many Armenians, many Armenians like the Jewish diaspora are quite well established. They're not coming back probably, but it was seen still as a very important symbolic proclamation. If you want to come back, you're very welcome, and therefore they wanted um, also their own repatriation law, which is not necessarily modeled on the law of return, but it's, it's very similar in nature. Um, we have a slightly different framework for returning residents, like 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 the Serbian diaspora. We also have both, let's say, um, um, Jewish diaspora who don't have citizenship, and we have Israelis that in recent years left the country. And uh, initially, Israel, the, the government, looked down upon them because, you know, like trade is especially difficult times. You've left the country with all kinds of difficulties, and you leave the country. And in recent years, the attitude of the government has changed completely, and they actively encourage uh, also uh, Israeli citizens who are living abroad to come back, and they're attracting them with different kinds of incentives, and that's the returning residents. Then there's other kind of migrants, I'm not going into them, but if you have questions, we have uh, refugees and labor migrants and whatnot. And they, they, in terms of in migration status, they come under different legislative and policy frameworks. Institutional, in terms of attracting the return of the diaspora, we have a Ministry of Immigrant Absorption, it's a very significant ministry, very strong ministry with re lots of resources for developing uh, programs to integrate returnees. The Jewish Agency for Israel is a non-governmental sort of partnership between the government on the one hand and the diaspora, which is responsible for reaching out to diaspora communities, providing them information about Israel and offering them opportunities to come back. I'm not sure if they have, uh, they have um, they call it, um, representatives around the world, I'm not sure if they're in, in Serbia, but basically um, they have a specific uh, government mandated job to to reach out to the African communities and uh, attracting them to come back. And it's very important to stress that this is a partnership between the diaspora and the government of Israel. Municipalities, many of the min bigger municipalities at least have their own, let's say, integration focal point of coordinator who are responsible for taking care of uh, diaspora members that come back. And then we have NGOs or immigrant associations. What is the idea? Let's say I'm originally from Holland. When I came to Israel, there was someone from the um, it's called the Dutch Immigrant Association. They wait for me at the airport. They provide, if necessary, legal assistance, legal counseling. They can advise me through this web of bureaucracy in Israel about different assistance that you can get. And it's very important. If you come from Serbia and you arrive in Israel, there will be a similar uh, association that deals with um, people from this part of the world who come to Israel. Um, very quickly, what, you know, what kind of assistance is awarded to people that uh, they decide to come to Israel, uh, immigrants? Um, and, you know, last it's not this information service. I would, I would say, especially because I understand some of you are represented from the media, information services are probably the most important to make sure that people will come back at the right and uh, understanding what they're getting into. Because the worst is, let's say, you attract people to come and they have still a very nostalgic um, point of view about what their homeland is about. And it's happened many times in, in, in the Aspas that they think everything at home is perfect, that in Serbia, for example, all the politicians um, are only working in the interest of, uh, of the public, and they, they think there's no bureaucracy, and that it's very easy to, to, to establish a business and to find employment. But the reality, of course, is, is different, the same in Israel. So you have to make sure that the right information in the right language is, is uh, coming to, to this audience. And also make sure that the audience at home, that the receiving communities, uh, receive the right information. Because otherwise these people come back, get certain incentive, incentives to come back, assistance, on a temporary basis, in order to make sure that they, they, the obstacles to integration are, are addressed. But people at home, they also have, uh, they live a daily life, which is quite difficult, and other people maybe have made money abroad, come back, and you get assistance, that doesn't look fair. So you have to make sure that the information services address also, uh, the, let's say, the home front, and I understand that the Ministry of the Aspa has a specific department dealing with that here in Serbia, which is a very good practice, and I think, you know, initially, Israel dealt with this through publication of brochures in many languages, for example, about military service, about social security. 
social security entitlements, um, different living, living uh, standards, housing, all those issues, they were addressed through publication, now it's all on the internet. And uh, also we use, let's say, satellite-based media to, to reach the, the audience, and I'm sure that it's the same for the, in the serving context. I just want to jump, these are categories of assistance that returnees receive, employment, very important learning the language because we have many of our members of the Oscar that return that don't necessarily speak Hebrew. And I'm sure that this is the case with second, third generation Serbians, um, maybe less so, but I'm, it's very important. So they, basically the state guarantees them a living allowance for the first six months so that they don't have to work, they can just learn the language. And that's very important for their duration. And um, very quickly, in general, I think our integration experience of, of immigrants in Israel is quite successful, even though there's many challenges. Integration assistance is, can be quite expensive. It's important to, to emphasize. It's also very important, for example, when we developed the program for returning Israelis. Israelis that are brought, you know, how do we attract them? So we did research, we did a survey. What are the problems for them to come back? They said, oh, we want to come back because our family is back home and, and because of, of the Israeli Hebrew speaking schools for our children. That you cannot determine, you cannot affect by policy. But what you can affect, another issue that they addressed was, you know, we, we are professionals working maybe in, in the US or in Europe, but we, have a, we don't have the network to find employment in our fields in Israel. We are ready to take a cut of, you know, we, to, to earn only 20% of what we earn at, at the moment, but we need employment before we come back. So what was done is to facilitate a certain IT, um, let's say, labor, labor um, workshops to invite Israeli companies to the to Silicon Valley IT companies, for example, and to make sure that they can already find a job while they're still abroad. Same with medical institutions, for example, attracting doctors. So you invite uh, medical institutions from Israel, to, for example, to a uh, work, um, they, let's say, employment fair in a country of destination. Um, also very important to stress is that the, 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 these type of return measures don't have to be permanent. Traditionally Israel, in its return, promotion, promoting return, was very much aiming at, um, you know, attracting people to come permanently in Israel. Today I think it's recognized, I hope it's very much recognized, that the target should be mobility. To promote mobility, and, and many people come back on a permanent, uh, on a less than permanent basis. I met several people uh, the other day here in Belgrade, Jews, local Jews that came to Israel. Now again, because of opportunities arising here in Serbia, returns to Serbia, but they still come to Israel. They still have, let's say, that project in Israel and project in Serbia, and that that shouldn't be seen as a failure. In, in, in you know, it, mobility should be promoted, and it, it, in often terms, it, it, it uh, promotes economic development. In general, also Israel's experience with immigration is, is that um, when when there were waves of immigration coming to Israel, for example, during the 90s, when we had over one million Jews from the former Soviet Union coming, it really promoted uh, local development. And uh, of course, it's very expensive to integrate these people, but overall, the economic impact has been. Uh, quite quite positive. Very quickly to the second um, lack of my presentation, which is about philanthropy. Israel is quite a success story when it comes to philanthropy. We mobilize every year about three billion US dollar plus for uh, different philanthropic projects. It's different from the Serbian experience, where you have more than that, maybe double, or perhaps triple in, in uh, remittances private contribution to the family. We don't have too much of that. We also don't have too much of private direct investment, which also, you know, you three your champions of community you very much try to promote. Unfortunately, that to different degrees has not been very successful in our case. However, we are a real successor when it comes to promoting philanthropy. And um, you cannot, you know, find perhaps any university, hospital, theater, Park that has not also, you know, of course the state is, 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 is more and more important in, in funding these institutions, but they also get contributions from uh, from diaspora. Um, 
I think civil society in Israel, the thousands of NGOs that exist, would not be able to sustain themselves without also a contribution from the diaspora. This is a very small contribution to the, of today's Israeli economy because the Israeli economy has grown quite a bit, but it's still quite substantial. And, it's, um, and it has a great symbolic um, importance in terms of the, par the sense of partnership between the diaspora and, and the government. Um, what is, there's different agencies to manage the diaspora home and relationship. And, 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 and I want to mention, we have a Ministry of Diaspora. It's not strong uh, in sense of the, the resources like the Ministry of Diaspora in, in, um, in Serbia. It is basically a result, like you, have, you know, it happens in in, um, in Serbia also. You know, you have you have elections, then you have to form a coalition government, and sometimes there's many parties involved in that uh, coalition, and everyone has to have a portfolio. So you create ministries. This happens also in Israel. So sometimes the portfolio of the Ministry of Diaspora was part of another ministry. Today we have our own Ministry of Diaspora. Unfortunately, they have very limited resources. It doesn't mean that the issue of diaspora is not important to the government. It just means that there are different agencies involved. For example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has its own diaspora department, and it's in fact the only government institution which has representation abroad. So it has, for example, its consulates. It has many consulates in the United States and in Europe, and they are partly located in, 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 in cities where we know there's a big, big uh, diaspora communities. They also manage so-called Israel homes, which are targeting specifically Israeli citizens living abroad to make sure that they do, you know, they do social networking type of activities and cultural programs. We have uh, Israel cultural um, centers, especially in Eastern Europe. So, these are managed to a great degree by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We have the presidency, which has a big symbolic role in the dialogue with the government. And we have the intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental sort of committee on the aspirations chaired by the Prime Minister. We have, more importantly, I think, are the, um, are the civil society in terms of managing the, the institutional framework for dialogue. I've mentioned the Jewish agency, which basically uh, the, the board of trustees includes both government representatives or government appointed representatives and people, uh, donors with, with other people from the diaspora. And, and I want to mention the Friends of Societies, which are basically, I, I spoke recently with a, a fundraiser for the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, I'm a graduate of that institution, and um, they raise every year on 50 million plus dollars to the friends of societies in Europe and, and um, in the U.S. It's very important because through the society, if a U.S. citizen, for example, gives money and donations through this university, it's tax deductible. And they, if they do it directly to an Israeli institution, it's more complicated. So they set up all these NGOs for their fundraising purposes. And I think this is relevant for Serbia. I don't see a reason why, for example, the University in Belgrade couldn't establish a friends of society in Chicago, targeting the alumni from the university, maybe to, to volunteer initially and then professionalize the, uh, gradually the, the fundraising effort. Um, business sector, as I mentioned, is not a huge um, sort of important factor in the interface between the diaspora and, and, and Israel because generally the, the attitude in the, in, the, in the diaspora is more that you know, Israel is a country of the, of the prophet, more spiritual homeland and not so much a, a country of profits, you know, to make money. Um, but there's, there's Israel bonds, which are important, you know, at times when Israel has difficulty financing its debt, it can rely on Israel bonds. The contributions spike generally during national crisis, during conflict, um, and um, billions and billions of dollars are contributed. Uh, it's basically a loan, it's, it, it, you know, formally it's an, it's an investment because you get back your money. But in many times people just say at the end of the, the, the expiration of the bond, they can say, I don't uh, want back my money, I leave it to, to, the, to the treasury of Israel, basically. And that's important, and I think also that's a, an instrument that could, could be experimented with in, in a country like Serbia. I know that, for example, India has a similar financial instrument for inviting um, diasporas to invest. Finally, in terms of um, promoting the connection between the diaspora and the moment, I would like to emphasize organized visits. Um, people are not likely to contribute just by 
you call them, and without having in, an individual um, investment in, in a particular project in Israel, it doesn't work. They, you have to engage with them. So we organize the, the organization where I used to work, for example, we have every year I think 500 donor missions. The people coming to see the project for themselves, they, they gain a certain sense of ownership over that project and then when they come home, they give money. It's very important. We have professional exchanges, for example, we send also Israelis abroad, Israeli students, Israeli doctors to, to have professional dialogues. It's important in, in ongoing, uh, let's say, engagement of, of, of the donors. And then we have, for example, youth engagement is very important because we, we all the time think about continuity. You know, if the, the diaspora is shrinking because people intermarry, um, and so, so we think about continuity and strengthening the identity. So we have birthright. I don't know if you have it in Serbia, this program, but it's basically organizing free of charge educational trips. I think we have almost a quarter of a million um, youngsters participating in these trips uh, over the last uh, eight, nine years. Um, they last for about a week. And, you know, we also have a little bit of an expectation once they get home that um, they will be motivated to contribute their engagement and eventually also contribute financially uh, towards different uh, programs in Israel. So, in conclusion, a few points, if I may. I have two minutes? Yeah. Um, so, you might say Israel is a unique place, you know, which is true. But there is, of course, uh, certain commonalities with other countries, including Serbia. Um, we have long time invested in this sense of partnership with the diaspora. That is true. We have uh, invested a lot in education of the children and, and, and Jewish education and, and uh, history of Israel, etc. It's an important investment. However, for example, you can say Israel is unique because it's in the, 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 there's a lot of unity and cohesion within the diaspora because it's mobilized around certain crises. Israel is in, is in, is in conflict with its neighbors, and that, it's true, you know, and, you know. So maybe if we didn't have that conflict, there would be many more differences, you know, and difference of opinion between the diaspora communities. And it's true that 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 the diaspora has really mobilized most resources during times of uh, crisis. But of course, Serbia has, has had its own uh, fair deal of, of, of national crisis, and uh, it also, you know, was sort of a rallying point of, of, of the diaspora. Also, we, you know, which is sort of an advantage, perhaps, when you have your diaspora concentrated in, in certain places in terms of outreach that makes it easier. So it's true that many of the of our diaspora are concentrated in big urban areas, like New York, for example, like uh, Paris or London, Moscow, but. You have also you know, concentrations in Chicago and whatnot. Um, then the duration of residence abroad. How much time did they have to establish their diaspora communities? It's true, Israel had perhaps more time. Some of the diaspora communities are more established. They had more time to, to get organized, um, to, to get themselves established socially and economically, and they better integrate, which helps. And some of the uh, service diaspora is, 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 is well, very well established, but other parts are, of course, newer and it takes time for them to, to get organized and to, to get established economically, socially, etc. But it's very important what, the, what we can take from the Israeli scenario is that you need formal institutions for dialogue between, on the one hand, the government and, and, and uh, the, the diaspora um, organizations. Uh, we have that institutionalized through, for example, the World Zionist Organization, where you have elections uh, for its representatives in the diaspora, pretty much like you have elections in Israel. Um, we don't have, um, elect, you know, the, the, the diaspora, when they don't have citizenship of Israel, they can, of course, not uh, participate in the elections. Even if they have citizenship and they live abroad, they, they have to return home to participate in the elections. I, I know that this is also being discussed in Serbia, and it's, uh, you know, there's different models to deal with that, and there's, uh, and also in Israel, there's an ongoing discussion. Um, you need joint governance of the project. So, for example, when we raise money, we have, we train, we train a diaspora community, for example, in Philadelphia, with a, a community, for example,